Our reading from the book of Genesis this morning includes the familiar passage of God's encounter with Abraham and Sarah, in which they receive the promise of being ancestors of a multitude of generations. In the establishment of this promise, they shift their identities into these new names. They're no longer Abram and Sarai. And so many centuries later, we still see in them ancestors in our faith. For some, maybe even ancestors by blood. Indeed, the Jewish people trace lineage through Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarai. And many Arab people trace theirs through Abraham and his first son, Ishmael. And on and on and on, down the many sometimes confusing family trees in the Bible, we receive this long list in the opening of the Gospel according to Matthew that traces the line from Abraham down to Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. I thought it would be a nice time out from the pre-assigned lectionary readings to stop today and consider this passage. And many of you know that there is a common lectionary of readings that assign various passages from different parts of the Bible every week. <coughs> and we largely in this congregation stick to that system more or less, keeping our stories heard common with other congregations. The first Sunday of Advent begins the church year, and this Advent we started with year A. That is, as it is known, which is the first year of our three-year lectionary cycle. And in year A, the majority of the gospel passages we read and preach about come from the gospel according to Matthew. And while we will read on Tuesday night on Christmas Eve from later in chapter 1, we will, read, we will read from Matthew how the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. This genealogy, this first half of chapter 1, is not part of the three-year lectionary cycle at all. I think lectors are happy about that. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> but I think not including this passage is unfortunate. You see, in our academically learned, biblically critical tradition, we've been so good about reconstructing and resurfacing the kind of environment into which Jesus was born, into which he lived and ministered. We study archaeology to see how people lived in the different places where Jesus was. We study papyrology to interpret the scriptural and other ancient texts to try to uncover as much as we can about the truths of the times. We study history itself just to see how the telling of stories and who gets to tell those stories affects our understanding of what actually happened. And we do all of this and more to get the best picture possible of what we might call in academic circles the historical Jesus. I'd like to suggest that a look into this text and the spirit of this family tree in the opening of Matthew's Gospel helps us to see another dimension of the world into which Jesus, the Word made flesh, was born. Because you see, not only knowing where you came from and how you got there, but who your ancestors were, is an amazing gift. In this version, which Anne read, the names of about a dozen additional women have been added to the original five that appear in the traditional gospel account, which helps to complete the story, although most women's names remain shamefully lost to history. And I'm just going to take a short tangent to say that many, many amazing papers and sermons have been written and given on the five women in the list in the Gospel of Matthew. So even though this sermon does not focus on that, you should do a little Googling on that if you get the chance. So Matthew's list shows how Jesus through his stepfather Joseph, is part of the royal line that included David, son of Jesse. 
This line of fallible human rulers that was broken was prophesied that it would be restored. And Jesus' place within that line gives hope to the idea that the Messiah could bring back glory to the throne, that throne of the ancient monarchy in Jerusalem. So could this baby, this rose of air blooming of Jesse's lineage, be the one? Later in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus' cousin John is in prison, John sends two emissaries to Jesus to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. So in his own enigmatic way, Jesus tells John, well, here's the evidence. You come up with a conclusion. Across the ages of our faith, it is one generation after the next that has seen the evidence and has come up with the conclusion that, yes, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And this community that's formed around Christ's name has witnessed to the work and word of Jesus in our lives and in history. We are a roaming band of folks, often blind, frequently deaf, not often enough poor. Yet we still try and see and hear and spread good news. And we call ourselves the ones called out by Jesus or simply the church. Some of you maybe have heard the adage that Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. And even though I wouldn't mind if some of the more hateful, exclusivistic part of the church would die off, this statement is actually true. You see, we can't have parents or step-parents or guardians that are part of the church, and yet we're not born into it. Church is something we grow into, something that we pass into through the waters and the promises of baptism, something that we pray into, something that we hope into and share into and love into. So I don't know about you, but I do kind of find family trees a little fascinating. And like many Americans of European descent, I have this weird attraction to royal family trees, especially that of the Queen of England, and her <laughs> ancestors, and cousins, and all of these countries around Europe, and so I was thinking about all of that, and then I was also, as I was preparing this sermon, realizing I've never really paid that much attention to my own family tree. I know enough about my parents and their siblings, Three of my grandparents had died before I was born. The last one died just after I turned four. So I don't really have any memory of my grandparents. And I don't even know the names of my great-grandparents or where they were from. I think I know where they were from, but I'm not sure. But yet I can tell you about Queen Victoria of the United <laughs> Kingdom, and King David of Israel, and even Jesus of Nazareth. For me, and maybe for you, that family that's gathered together in Christ's name, that family that's gathered together around a covenant with God, well, that family means an awful lot to me. So for me, and maybe for you, those memories of singing Silent Night while not noticing the wax dripping all down your sleeve, or a ribbon cutting after a completed renovation, retirement of a beloved pastor, it's those moments that help pass down the generational love of church. And I remember in my own church family seeing and hearing a handbell choir for the first time as a teenager when I didn't even know that such a, a marvelous thing could exist. <laughs> and then later playing those bells with Jerry and Nancy and Linda and John and Janet 
and Rick. But being in committee meetings, making big decisions about finances, and thanking God for the calm leadership of Tom and Marsha. And some of those folks aren't with us anymore. And even through the often good and sometimes boring sermons, or the often boring and sometimes good anthems, this is at my church. <laughs> I guess what ended up taking root was love. And in this brief time that I've been here at Covenant, I've heard the names of some of the generations that have gone on before us that we see here as our ancestors. I read in our poinsettia dedication list not only names like you might find in a Bible chapter, but between those names, in the spaces, just hidden right there, the love that links those names together. Love that I've heard between the spaces and among the words when I hear people remember folks with names like Dean, or Elsa, or Newell. And even though I didn't know those people, I know that that love is still here, and it's become part of me too. That love, that love that lives in the spaces between us, between us and those people, it connects us to that great source of love that I call God. It's that love that even though for people who are too old to have children, maybe sitting here in these pews, are still able to be new parents to others. Teaching us about God, teaching us about love that never fails, teaching us about love from generation to generation. And if you listen very closely, you can still hear Sarah laughing across the generations and God whispering, I told you so. <laughs> Amen. Please join me in singing hymn in the black hymnal number 165, Love Came Down. <laughs> 